Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Um, I'm just curious, who here is on the more farming end of things? And raise your hand if farming is like your center. Awesome. And how about nutrition work and nutrition as your center? Cool. Uh, yeah, both. I'm in that category. Both. Yay. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. We have a real mix. And um, I'm Jordan. I run a collaborative clinical nutrition practice with a practice partner which focuses mostly on support for people who are navigating chronic and complex conditions using food and lifestyle changes, nutrients as our primary toolkit. Um, I'm also a teacher, so I instruct for the Nutritional Therapy Association, which is an online practitioner training program in holistic nutrition that really centers that connection between how food is produced and how it interacts with our bodies. Um, and then in my, the time that I can fit around those things, I am the support person for my wife who runs the dairy farm. We took over from her family seven years ago and have transitioned from a more conventional system to 100% grass-fed organic. And so thinking about nutrient dynamics and how they flow through our whole ecosystem, soil, plants, animals, people, circle, is really the thread that ties all my work together and something I think about all the time. And so I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because it's so central to the um, communication that's happening here this weekend. And I've been so inspired already by the conversations I've heard um, that tie directly into the conversation we'll have today, but from the plant eco, you know, the agricultural ecosystem perspective. So today we're gonna talk on the human nutrition side. And um, and really this weekend, I think the human nutrition track is asking that question. We're here because there's a strong you know, felt sense. It's like we know that bringing nutrient density to or returning it to our food supply is important. But why? When we get to that human nutrition end, can we talk about, can we understand what is so important about that nutrient organization in our bodies. And so that's, that's what we're gonna work on today. We're gonna think first about a framework for thinking about this. So we're gonna set up some kind of st a style of thinking. And then we're gonna talk about enzymes and how they partner with micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. And then we're gonna walk through the whole digestive tract with this perspective in mind for thinking about enzymatic facilitation and the role that micronutrients play. And then we will talk a little bit about tying that all together, where we're sourcing nutrients, that kind of thing. So, I love this quote. The most beautiful gift of nature is that it gives one pleasure to look around and try to comprehend what we see. Albert Einstein. So, our frames for thinking today. And these are core to the conversation all weekend, so probably nothing new, but we are our environment. So we're made of our environment. And when we think through the biochemical lens, which is the lens we're gonna be thinking through today, it's not the only one available to us, it's really important to center this idea that what we take in can break down, absorb, metabolize, and maybe detoxify successfully really creates the resource base, the toolkit that we have to use when we're talking about our biochemistry. The second one is that we are an environment. So we're made of our environment, we're also an ecosystem. And this is something I've also heard threaded through the conversations this weekend is, you know, the science is exploding, but it looks like we're a compound organism. Our human tissue is home to a host of microbial life, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, that have a constant bi-directional communication with our human physiology. So what's going on in our inner ecosystems absolutely affects our health on a daily basis. Which brings us to health as adaptation. And this is one we're gonna try on for size today. It's also not the only way to think about health. But I love this quote from Kelly Brogan, someone was asking me earlier, she's an integrative psychiatrist whose work I really appreciate, and she says, the thing is, our bodies don't make mistakes. They adapt and adapt and adapt some more. They work hard to establish equilibrium in an environment that is unpredictable at best. The complexity of the interconnected processes they use for this adaptation deserves awe and nothing less. We are just beginning to peek through the keyhole of our physiology, and it is incredible. So this idea, 
health as adaptation, that our bodies are always brilliantly adapting for survival right now based on the information they're getting from our context, my environment, both the present one and some information from past environments I've experienced. And they're putting that together and making adaptive decisions based on also the resources they have available to use. So this brilliant adaptation for survival right now happening based on the constraints and maybe stressors in our environment and the resources that we have to use for that adaptation. And that adaptation ends up looking like a spectrum, right? Sometimes we have to do really radical adaptation for survival. Often that comes with a high symptom burden. We feel that. Or in contexts that are less stressful and more abundant in resources, we might be able to do adaptation that's a lot more easeful, that allows for abundant energy creation, you know, creative thought, experiencing pleasure, doing our work in the world. So if we think of health as the expression of that adaptation, how can we shift environments, human environments, from that context of really needing to adapt to survive to being able to sort of adapt to thrive? Which brings us to symptoms as a language. Symptoms are communication from the body. And in this culture, we tend to kind of equate symptoms with illness, right? We think the symptom is the problem. The symptom is what needs to be fixed. But if I have my hand on a hot surface and I'm experiencing pain, is pain the problem? No, right? The hot surface, something I have to change in my environment and the pain is telling me there's an environmental change that needs to occur. So, if we put it all together and we think of ourselves, we're stepping into this role as wishing to support our health, the health of our friends and family, community, the health of our clients and patients maybe, with nutrition as a primary toolkit, then we can put on our detective hat, our puzzle doer hat, and we can start to learn about what environmental contexts cause stress for our physiology. And what ways does our physiology, does our body tend to adapt in condi under conditions of stress? And what does our symptom profile, or you could plug in lab work data, data is great to collect here, what does all that data coming from our body tell us about the kinds of adaptations that are having to be made? And if we're using our nutrition lens as our toolkit for this process, then what do nutrients have to do? with how our body can adapt to any given set of stressors. And this detective over here is thinking about an enzyme. <laughs> and that's because nutrients play all kinds of different roles in our body, right? So we have macronutrients, nutrients that we consume in quantity, which is you know, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water. So we have to take a lot of that stuff in and those are important. We also have micronutrients that we consume in smaller quantities, vitamins, minerals, I think you could put phytochemistry in this category two, that are also really important. So just because we consume them in smaller quantity does not mean they don't have an essential role to play in facilitating this adaptive response. And they do lots of different things in the body, but one of the most important roles vitamins and minerals have is creating enzymes and helping them work. And so we should talk about enzymes when we're gonna think about adaptation. Enzymes. <laughs> so our bodies are transformers, right? We're taking that environment that's around us, we're breaking it down, we're taking it in into our bloodstream and we're rebuilding ourselves, everything that we need to function from those nutrients. And the reactions that it takes, so we're putting things together <laughs> and taking them apart all the time. That's how our human world goes round. And in order to put something together, oh, I have a pointer here. <laughs> in order to put two things together, in this case, carbon dioxide and water, and to get a new product, in this case, carbonic acid, there's a whole lot of energy that has to get input into that system. So that red curve is the activation energy that would be required to put those two things together and make something new. And that is so much energy, actually, that given the conditions on Earth and the conditions that it takes for survive, so we're not living in a hyper-pressurized environment and we're not living in an inferno, those, that activation energy is so much that the reactions would occur on a time frame that's way slower than is compatibility with our life. So I was reading an article on magnesium for this and it said, how long would reactions take if they proceeded spontaneously without the presence of enzymes? 
Dr. Richard Wolfenden, an alumni professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the University of North Carolina, posed this question. In a 1995 study, Wolfenden reported that without enzymes, the process of synthesizing DNA and RNA would take 78 million years. A subsequent study in 2008 found that producing cellular hemoglobin in the absence of enzymes would be 30 times slower, with a half-life of 2.3 billion years. That's half the age of the Earth. So, in the absence of a facilitator, the amount of energy we need to do, put things together and take things apart in our body might take millions of years and we need to take a fraction of a second. And so in come enzymes. Enzymes are the facilitators that ends up, end up lowering this activation energy and allowing us to do these reactions of putting things together and taking things apart millions of times a second or a minute. So they're really important. And what enzymes are, are they're macromolecules. They're made out of protein. So that's good to remember. They are amino acid chains. This is a computer rendition of a, an amino acid chain for carbonic anhydrase, which is the enzyme we're talking about when we put CO2 and H2O together to get carbonic acid, carbonic anhydrase. This is the computer's idea. I think it looks cool. Um, but enzymes are, yeah, they're proteins, chains of proteins, and they facilitate reactions. They're specific to specific reactions. So it's not that I need to do things in my body, I need to put things together, and I need to take things apart, and any old enzyme that's around can do that. This particular enzyme can only do this kind of reaction. So that's important to know. The enzyme needs to be appropriate for the reaction. We also need the things that it's putting together or taking apart to be in the environment. So those things have to bind to the enzyme. Also, Enzymes require an environmental context to work. So they also don't just work anywhere at any time. They require a pH that's specific to them. So usually there's some kind of acidity or alkalinity that that enzyme is going to work best in or work at all in. We also need temperature to be in a good place. So the temperature is going to be specific to that enzyme. And then there are different things that inhibit or promote enzymatic function. So if an enzyme is in an environment with inhibitors for that specific enzyme, it's also going to struggle to work. And this is a beautiful design, right? Because we don't want reactions occurring willy-nilly wherever, at whenever. I think a good example of this is the protein digesting enzymes we'll talk about that come from our pancreas, and we use them to digest dietary protein, right? But our human tissue is also protein. So if those protein digesting enzymes were always active in my pancreas while I was waiting to eat, I would be struggling. They would be digesting me. And instead, I want them to focus on the food that I took in. And so when they get released into my small intestine, they're going to experience their specific pH, their specific, um, actually, relief of inhibition. Inhibitors are going to leave, and they are going to be promoted to work. Not all enzymes but a significant number, really important for this conversation, also require a nutrient cofactor. So when we think about cofactors, in the scientific literature, they're sort of described in three ways. One of them is that it's a group of micronutrients that are bound really strongly to an enzyme and, and travel pretty much always with that enzyme. That's called a prosthetic group. We can think of the heme and hemoglobin like that. So that's a little bit different because it is almost, it's part of the enzyme. It's always traveling. But then we have two groups, coenzymes and cofactors in the scientific literature. And coenzymes are vitamin derived usually, there's a few exceptions. And they bind more loosely to the enzyme. And when they're bound, the enzyme can work. And when they're unbound, the enzyme is sort of prepared to work but can't do its job. So the same thing goes for a set of minerals. So we have those vitamins that are coenzymes. When they bind to the enzyme that needs them, they can do their work, do the work. When um, we have a set of minerals that acts like that too, and these are positively charged minerals. They have a plus two charge usually, um, but magnesium, zinc, iron, cobalt, molybdenum, these are some of the big ones. And so the partnership between enzymes and their nutrient cofactors is also specific. It's not that this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, is the same enzyme we've been using, can just work um, whenever a mineral is around. It needs to partner with zinc. Zinc is its specific cofactor. And so in order for, this to ha in order for that um, water and carbon dioxide to come together, zinc needs to be around so that the enzyme can be activated to do its job. So this was a super eye-opening moment in nutrition for me. Because I learned about enzymes in high school. I thought they were amazing, but I didn't learn about them this way. And when um, 
when we think about that adaptation, how is the body having to adapt to a certain environment? What are its resources available to use? The amount of, we need, we need it to be able to freely do whatever biochemical reactions it wants to do in that scenario to facilitate that adaptation being more easeful rather than more stressful. And in order for it to do those reactions, so, so this is where we put on our puzzle doing hats as people interested in nutrition, and I can think, okay, if I'm getting a lot of information from someone based on their symptom profile, their context, their um, maybe some lab work that I took in, I'm getting an understanding from them that there might be some reactions in their body that are rate limited. It looks like they're not producing a whole lot of stomach acid. It looks like they might be a little shy in enzymes in their pancreas. Maybe based on these symptoms, their glutathione need is really high and they're not meeting that antioxidant need in their body. I can start to learn into well, what kind of reactions do we need to do to make that antioxidant glutathione? What kind of reactions do we do to need to do to make stomach acid? And then, if that kind of reaction needs to happen, what enzymes do that work? And if I know what enzymes do that work, do they need a cofactor nutrient in order to do that work? And often enzymes need one or several cofactor nutrients to do that work. And I can start to kind of step into this role as a facilitator. I loved yesterday Guido's conversation where he was like, the rules are trust the body and then don't control, collaborate. That's this principle. Can I act as a partner, an informed partner with my body and say, if you're trying to make hydrochloric acid with this carbonic anhydrase enzyme, and it doesn't look like it's going so well, what if we focused on offering you an abundant amount of zinc? And if that really is the rate limiting step in that enzymatic function, you could go ahead and produce that hydrochloric acid to the, con to the extent that your body needs to do that right now. And so this is the scope we're gonna take, this is the lens we're gonna take when we travel through the digestive tract right now, is if we're looking at facilitation, this really foundational form of facilitation, how are we, you know, what are we, what nutrients are we curious about for digestion? So, the digestive system. Um, I chose digestion because it's totally foundational to nutrition work and because it is um, really where this inner ecosystem and outer ecosystem meet in our bodies, right? It's kind of a hub for the outer meeting the inner. And also, if we're talking about being made of our environment, like we were before, well, this is, the, um, this is how, what governs how well we break things down and absorb them. So whatever I'm taking in, I need to be digesting it effectively in order to get those nutrients into my bloodstream. And it's also a hub for our microbiome. So when we talk about being an ecosystem, this is a really important place to look. It's not the only place to look. We are microbiomes, but it turns, seems like the digestive tract is a hub. And because of that, because it's a hub for our microbiome and it's the place where our internal and external environments meet, our immune system pays a lot of attention here. So I have a lot of immune function sort of watching, embedded in that um, mucosal lining, mucosal area of my small intestine, checking out, hey, is there something we need to adapt to in the environment? What should my immunological decisions be here? And immunological decisions have a big impact on our health, right? What our immune system is deciding to do really affects how we feel, what the symptom burden is like, and what that adaptive capacity is like. So the digestive system as a hub. Digestion is a north to south process. This is a mantra that we teach at the Nutritional Therapy Association. It's really an important one because Yes, there is a whole lot of bi-directional communication going on in our GI tract. Because of all that microbial, hopefully, all that microbial life, we're getting information from our GI tract to our brain and back down again. But the way that food moves through our GI tract and how it is broken down, absorbed, or excreted is absolutely a top to bottom chain that requires every step of the process. And when we think about symptoms, well, we've talked about we think of symptoms as illness. If we're thinking about symptoms as something that needs to be um, suppressed, we often focus, a lot of our symptoms manifest in the lower part of the GI tract, right? It's constipation or diarrhea or gas and bloating. I'm really feeling it in the lower GI. And really, if something is happening, if there's some kind of disruption, adaptive disruption in the lower GI, there's always 
dysfunction going on in the upper GI, some kind of stress that's happening up top that is putting pressure on the system lower down in the chain. So this is a really wonderful foundational way to work with digestion. So if we're working north to south, where does digestion start? I heard a lot of the mouth, which is a great um, idea. <laughs> and I'm going to push us to look even farther north than the mouth and say the brain. Digestion starts in our nervous system. So this is actually, I think, really important to the work at, that the BFA is doing and this idea of returning nutrient density to our food supply because nutrient density seems to track with sensory input from our food, right? We get better flavor, color, aroma, seems to track over nutrition. So this is a really important thing for our nervous system. The nervous system in our, um, that govern, the part of our nervous system that governs our GI function is our autonomic nervous system. So that is the part of our nervous system that's working w not under my conscious control. So my breathing, my heart rate, digestion are big ones. That nervous system is always gauging my environment. Is this environment more safe or is it more threatening? And how should I organize biology, my biology, based on whether I need to organize around safety or a little bit more around threat? And the nervous, the, the nerve and the nervous system that governs digestion specifically is our parasympathetic system and the vagus nerve, this 10th cranial nerve that runs all the way down from our brain stem and innervates every part of our GI tract. It really functions on the side of the spectrum in which our nervous system is taking information in around safety. So you could call the parasympathetic system, I call it rest, digest, socialize, and heal sometimes. And that vagus nerve really needs that input. This is a safe place to digest. I'm getting information, good information, that this is an appropriate time to prioritize digestion and not prioritize running away or increasing my heart rate or staying frozen. All those things take priority over digestion if our body is sensing the need to do that. So our vagus nerve is really important in stimulating every part of the digestive tract. And I love this picture of the vagus nerve because you can see if you look at the digestive system and you look at where all those little neurons are coming off in the vagal system, it tracks pretty close to our digestive system, which means that at every point in that stop, every stop in that chain, my nervous system is saying, hey, get ready, food is coming in. So before I even take a bite, of my food, if I'm engaged with that food, if I'm thinking about eating, cooking, smelling that food, socializing around that food, my digestive tract is starting to prepare for eating. So even though these aren't direct enzymatic cofactors, I think they're important cofactors because this is a step we often bypass when we're looking at digestive health. We need to be engaged with our food, and then ideally when our food goes into our mouth, it has a complexity of flavor, especially bitter flavors. This was a big part of Guido's talk yesterday. Bitters really trigger that vagus system. They're kind of a, they're, they have a special affinity for the vagus nerve. And when we get complex bitter flavors, our nervous system gets a big heads up that we're gonna be needing to deal with nutrients. This makes a lot of sense, right? If something alerts our sensory input that it's gonna be nutrient dense, well, our body better prepare to deal with those nutrients. The other nutrient I put up here is choline, which is in the B vitamin family, but that's because the neurotransmitter that the vagus nerve uses for its communication is acetylcholine. So this is a specific neurotransmitter that, is, that the vagus uses for all those steps, and um, choline is an important substrate to make acetylcholine. I don't have a slide for the mouth, but the mouth is important. We take a bite of food, and, um, and hopefully we're chewing it. Chewing turns out to be really important. Signaling mechanism goes right back up to that nervous system and right back down to the rest of the GI tract. There are some really interesting studies about liquid meals that have the exact same nutrient um, profile as the solid meal, and volunteers eat both, and their digestive system misses half the memo when they eat a liquid meal. Um, so we're a little obsessed with smoothies and juices and stuff like that. Right now, culturally, we want to keep in mind chewing is pretty important. Um, so we, in the mouth, we mix also our food with saliva, and it's the first steps that it's going to have to interact with um, some enzymes, a little bit of carbohydrate and fat digestion in the mouth. We need a bunch of water and electrolytes in that saliva. And then we swallow the food down. Oh, maybe I'll go back here. We swallow the food down through that esophagus at the top. And we get down to this um, lower esophageal sphincter and into the stomach, which is over here on the left side. 
And the stomach is really a preparation chamber for digestion. So we don't do a whole lot of, we, don't, we do very little absorption in the stomach. And we, in some ways, don't even do a whole lot of digestion. We do a really important amount of preparation. And so the things, the, the um, substances that we need to do that preparation are really hydrochloric acid and the um, protein digesting enzyme pepsin. And hydrochloric act, acid activates pepsin. So our stomach should be a really acidic environment. And that acid is made in the mucosal lining of my stomach. So my stomach should also ideally have a really robust mucosa, right? Because we want to protect the muscle tissue from that acid environment. And in that mucosa are some cells called parietal cells. And they're getting a signal from the acetylcholine coming from the vagus nerve, histamine, actually really important for stimulating stomach acid production, a hormone called gastrin. There are some others. We're getting some information that food is coming in. Protein, eating protein is one of the things that sends us that signal, um, also that vagus function. So, and when food comes into the stomach, the stomach receptors themselves get stretched and it's like, okay, things are rolling. We should start producing hydrochloric acid. So now we see our friend, carbonic anhydrase, our enzyme example, come into play. So we need to bring water into the stomach lining. We need to bring CO2. And then we need to put those things together into carbonic acid so that it can disassociate into bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion. We need that hydrogen ion to produce HCl, which is stomach acid. And what was the cofactor for carbonic anhydrase? Zinc, yes. So we need zinc. In order to be doing this first step of stomach acid production, there has to be enough zinc around that the carbonic anhydrase can bind to um, that zinc and facilitate this reaction. So then we get the bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion. Super interesting, we're, sending some, we're creating acid in our stomach, but we're actually sending something alkaline into the blood. And we need to get that hydrogen now from the parietal cell in my stomach lining into the lumen, the middle of my stomach, so that it can bind with a chloride that's also traveling there, an electrolyte mineral, and make HCl. And what is actively transporting that hydrogen into the lumen? It's a proton pump. So if you've ever taken a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, or know someone who has, this is the pump that they're, they're saying, nope, no hydrogen's gonna get pumped into the stomach, therefore you can't make acid. The other things we use to block acid production are often histamine blockers, H2 blockers. So that's saying, nope, no signaling to this cell. Um, so if we need to pump hydrogen actively into the lumen of the gut, we need energy, we need ATP. And this is a common refrain, it's gonna show up all over the GI tract, so I thought I'd mention it here, but when we're thinking about cofactors for digestion, digestion is a really energy intensive process. We're doing active transport at all kinds of different steps in the digestive process, this is just one, and we need ATP, which means that we have to talk about energy. Because energy, making energy, is a very enzymatically intensive process and cofactor intensive process. So many of us have learned these cycles, the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, at different times we've had to memorize it. But this is one of the primary ways our body makes energy out of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. They plug into the system. And it's a series of, whoops, <laughs> it's a series of enzymatic reactions. One enzyme, two enzymes. These enzymes are going around in a circle doing transformation. And at most of the steps in that enzymatic work, they require a cofactor. All of these little B vitamins here are cofactors for those enzymatic reactions. This is another picture of the same cycle, which just highlights that cofactors are really important to this energy creation. And when we think about energy creation and its cofactors, we want to think about B vitamins. This is a big part of what B vitamins are doing. Thiamine, B1, riboflavin, B2, niacin, B3, pantothenic acid, B5, those are all really important, show up all over this this um, cycle, and then in smaller amounts, depending on what kinds of nutrients we're trying to convert, we have B6, B12, and folate, B9. And so these B vitamins are really important if we're thinking about needing to produce <laughs> the energy to get the hydrogen ion into the stomach, we're already thinking about B vitamins. So in order to make that stomach acid, and in order to start to have it activate the pepsin that is required for protein digestion, we need 
vagal tone, we need that vagus system to be functioning. We need protein as a stimulus and also for building enzymes. We need water, because we're making the acid partly out of water. We need electrolyte minerals, that chloride is coming in. We need B vitamins to make energy. We need zinc as a cofactor for carbonic anhydrase. And we need vitamin A as another cofactor that helps keep that mucosa healthy. So we're, just, we're talking about all of these nutrients coming in just to set us up for digestion in the stomach. The stomach is really, it's, it's that, you know, it's that preparation chamber. The preparation is important because it's, it ends up being a microbial mediator, right? So we don't want any old microbe getting into our GI tract. We kind of should be able to eat probably a pretty microbially rich diet and be okay. Only if we have functional HCL and pepsin on board in order for me to eat something with salmonella and not get salmonella, I need that stomach to be working really well. I also need to start that protein digestion um, here to set us up for the rest. And I also need to start to cleave vitamins and minerals off of my food. They're kind of hard to pull off the food that we're eating. And this preparation in the stomach is really where that process gets jump started. They're usually stored in, and brought in. I mean, yes, we, so in this case, we haven't even digest, we haven't absorbed any of the nutrients that came in with this food. So we're using zinc that would already be around or B vitamins that would already be around. Yeah, they have to be around. So moving on, we went through the stomach. Now we're at the base of the stomach, the pyloric valve, and we can start to enter into the small intestine which it's like all these different buttons on this thing. Um, right here, the top of the small intestine is the duodenum. The small intestine is really where digestion gets going. It, where, it's where it starts in a big way to where we break down the long chains that we've eaten into small particles that we want to be absorbing into our bloodstream. And in order for digestion to be happening well in the small intestine, we need that stomach setup we talked about, but we also need a good deal of input right at the beginning from the pancreas and also from the gallbladder. So we'll go there. So we can talk, I don't, I'm gonna, I wanna not get into protocols, but we will, um, but I think thinking about it from this perspective is really important and not often done. So we're gonna think, when we think about microbial colonization throughout the GI tract, we wanna think, is the body making a big mistake that there's a, mic a microbe colonizing? You know, it just made a huge error. Or is something challenged in this environmental adaptation that's creating an opening for that ecology to exist? And when we look at it from that perspective, it's not that we never use an antibiotic or something, but we are also at least really working from this foundational angle. And yeah, so when we talk about something like vinegar, we are actually stimulating the vagus nerve often, or, or bitters. Um, we're increasing the acidity maybe in the GI tract also, but we're also giving a heads up to that nervous system to say, hey, start to pay attention here. Um, so yeah, vinegar can be helpful. It's just one of, one of many tools. Um, so, we travel down to the, into the duodenum, and we need to get this fluid input now to really begin breaking things down with pancreatic input and um, input from the gallbladder, the liver gallbladder. When we think about the pancreas and its digestive functions, the pancreas has a whole nother blood sugar regulation function. When we think about the pancreas and its digestive function, it's all about enzymes. This is where the enzymes are made and then um, transported to the small intestine that break up those long chains of proteins, those long chains of fats, those long chains of carbohydrates. And so we need to think about what does the pancreas need to be producing adequate amount of, adequate amount of enzymes and to be releasing those enzymes in appropriate quantities into the GI tract when we eat. So we need that vagus nerve signaling, it's talking to the pancreas too. We need all of that northern function. So this will start to be a refrain in our north to south process. If I want to support pancreatic function, I'm not just thinking about the pancreas. I'm thinking about the body as a whole system. And I'm wondering, what about that nervous system or stomach environment wasn't totally sending the signals to the pancreas that it needed in order, you know, we didn't prep digestion maybe in the way that was ideal. So I want to be thinking about the cofactors that I need for the northern part as I'm thinking about how to troubleshoot in the pancreas. The pancreas needs some, we need to have eaten some fat and protein to communicate to the pancreas that it needs to offer enzymes into the duodenum. We also, there's some hormones, secretin and CCK, that end up being um, released by the duodenum itself to communicate. 
And then we need protein to make the enzymes. We need water because these enzymes are hydrolases. They use water to break up the bonds. And we need magnesium as a cofactor for protein synthesis and zinc because the other thing that the pancreas does, it releases enzymes into the small intestine to start to break apart our food. It also releases bicarbonate, so basically baking soda. Because when that food came in from the stomach, it was all bound up with acid, right? And the stomach has a really robust mucosa, ideally. It can resist that acidic environment, but our small intestine has a really thin mucosa to facilitate diffusion into our bloodstream. So it doesn't do well with a really acidic environment. So we need to neutralize the things that came in from our stomach. And if we don't neutralize them, what could we maybe end up with? An ulcer, right? A duodenal ulcer. So the bicarbonate we saw before, it's made with that same enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, that requires zinc as a cofactor. Before we needed the hydrogen ion, now we need the bicarbonate, so we need zinc. So all of these cofactors for pancreatic enzyme production and secretion, which brings us to the liver gallbladder. So bile produced in our liver, stored in our gallbladder. So our liver is producing bile. It's storing it in this balloon, our gallbladder. And when the food comes in through the small intestine and the gallbladder gets appropriate signaling from our vagus nerve and from the food that we ate, the balloon can squeeze and we can release bile into the small intestine. And bile is a really under, undersung hero of our health in general, but also of digestion. It plays a bunch of important roles. One of them is fat emulsification. It's a detergent. So in order for those pancreatic enzymes to work on the nutrients that we're eating, we need to break the fat up into little globules that have a high surface area that the enzyme can work on. It's also an agent of detoxification. So our liver is a huge detox organ, right? And it's processing things and the fat soluble things that it processes, it puts into the bile so that we can release them through our GI tract. So it's really important to detoxification that our bile is high quality so it can grab and hold those fat soluble toxins and get them out. We also are learning that bile is kind of a microbial mediator too. So when bile is traveling down the small intestine, it is making sure that it's creating an environment that is not super hospitable to most kinds of bacteria. Um, and when we're thinking about the microbiome in our GI tract, we really want most of the microbial activity to be in our lower GI tract, our colon. Just like um, we heard with the question, if we're getting bacteria and overgrowth of bacteria in other places, like our stomach with the H. pylori, that starts to be a stressor in our system. Um, and the small intestine looks like that. This science is still totally emerging, but there's definitely an ecosystem that should be in your small intestine, but it probably shouldn't be as elevated in numbers of bacteria or fungi as the environment in our colon. And bile traveling through that system is one of the things that helps that stay true. So not only do we need to be producing bile for fat digestion, for detoxification, and for microbial mediation, we also need it to be high quality bile. Because if it doesn't have all its component parts, it doesn't do all of its jobs very well. And so here is this long list of things that we need to be nutrients, that need to be coming in as cofactors for this bile creation process. We need that vagus to be working. We need all the northern function, the stomach, um, the mouth, the brain. We need, again, some hormonal stimulation. And then we need these amino acids, taurine, a sulfur-based amino acid, glycine, which doesn't come from muscle meat, right? It's bones, cartilage, skin. Fatty acids, cholesterol, phosphatidylcholine, all of these are fats. So we can start to see that we're running into some function and dysfunction circles here, right? If I'm not digesting my fats because I'm not producing high quality bile and I need fats to make bile, uh-oh, I'm not digesting my fats. I'm in a cycle of challenge that is, that's challenging to break. This is where this facilitation role for us facilitators comes in. Vitamin C is a cofactor for bile production. Vitamin A, vitamin B6, we need those electrolyte minerals and water again. So we're seeing hydration come up again and again. Functional hydration, nutrient dense water come up again and again throughout this process. We need sulfur in part for those amino acids, zinc, magnesium, and iron, all of these cofactors to make high quality bile. So 
the small intestine. And we're really in the small intestine already, right? The pancreas and the gallbladder are putting their fluids into the small intestine so we can start to break things down into small pieces and absorb them across into the bloodstream from the small intestine. But that is, the small intestine is this hub. It's where this absorption comes in. It's where most of our nutrient absorption occurs. And it has an amazing surface area. So it's like this folded, um, its, its whole job is to make the, have the most capacity for absorption possible for nutrients. So not only does it have these big folds, these rugae, but it has these little shag carpet villi that reach out like our human root system into the digestive tract and are very enzymatically active, pulling things, pulling nutrients across into our bloodstream. And the small intestine, really the cofactors, the most important cofactors for small intestine support are all the northern cofactors that we've talked about already because we, try, we need to set up the environment in the small intestine to be as optimal for digestion as we can. So we need vagal tone, that vagus communication, we need all that northern function that allows for pancreatic enzymes released there, bicarbonate, bile, and then for, in specific ways for the mucosal health of this system, vitamin A, zinc, magnesium, and then a lot of active transport here, a lot of need for ATP. So all of those B vitamins that we saw in energy regulation, so important for keeping our small intestine functional. And then we have this piece about the immune system because that's where, our, you know, we said before, our immune system is really watching what's going on in our small intestine pretty closely. And so we need to support our immune system in being balanced, attentive but balanced, in terms of the kind of reaction it has to what's going on in our small intestine. And this is a hub, so this is where a lot of our symptoms show up. The small intestine, if I'm getting a lot of bloating, gas, IBS type symptoms, often that's a sign something's going on in my small intestine. And the nutrition world right now is pretty excited about sort of some diagnoses in the small intestine. So there's this idea of SIBO, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth that's starting to emerge where we're seeing, okay, maybe there's a correlation. If I'm getting too much bacteria or fungi growing in my small intestine, which I would rather have growing in my colon, but it's moved up into my small intestine or down into my small intestine for some reason, that correlates really closely with having these IBS-like symptoms. I'm getting digestive stress, gas, bloating, um, you know, diarrhea, constipation from the metabolism of these organisms that are kind of, that are hanging out in overabundance in the small intestine. And if we're thinking more from our symptom approach, symptom troubleshooting model, what are, what are some common um, therapies we're using for this right now? Does anyone know? Antibiotics and um, some pretty strong microbial mediators like essential oils of oregano and that kind of thing. And that's really this idea, that's taking this reasoning of there's an overgrowth of bacteria, that's the problem. We better kill the bacteria, that's the solution. And what I'm seeing often, I get clients who've been through this process already, and there's a really high recurrence rate, like really high. So people feel better for a couple weeks, and then the microbes regrow. And why, if we want to take our lens of ecosystem dynamics, how could we maybe approach this process differently? So with the small intestine, it's a really important place for nutrient breakdown and absorption, right? It's, if I say I'm made of my environment, this is the place that's mediating that. If I can't break down these nutrients and get them across into my bloodstream, I don't have all that chemistry I need to do my human biochemical reactions. So that's a really high priority for my body. We need to be breaking down nutrients in our small intestine. And if my stomach acid production is not so great and I missed the memo on pancreatic enzymes because I was missing some cofactors and my bile is like a little bit not conjugated super well and I'm ending up in the small intestine with only kind of half of the fluids I need to be breaking down that food well, that means my, my part of the human ecosystem, there's kind of a niche open, right? I'm not doing that job super well anymore. And what happens in ecosystems if a niche becomes open? If there's an ecological job that needs to occur and the community that was doing it before is not available for some reason? Somebody else comes in. So if I'm in ecology and my, the human part of my system is kind of dropping the ball on the digestive function 
And there are other organisms that I'm hosting that could do that for me. They could break down those nutrients. My body might say, it's all right. It's OK if you come on up, bacteria, fungi, from my colon into my small intestine. And they will do that work for us. There are bacteria that will break down anything. Um, so they'll start to digest our food for us, which is really useful. Thanks, SIBO. <laughs> but they also are metabolic organisms, right? So while they're digesting, if I digest my food for myself, I don't produce a whole lot of acids or gases or other metabolic byproducts in that process. If fungi or bacteria are doing it for me, they will. And I have to work on that collateral, you know, I have to um, deal with that collateral symptom burden that comes when I get irritation at my small intestinal lining or gas and bloating from those bacterial byproducts. Um, but it's not, it's not just the system going totally awry, right? We could look at it as this adaptive response, and we could answer that need, that call from the symptom profile to say, how could you adjust the ecosystem function not to need that microbial overgrowth anymore? Should we start with the cofactors from the top of digestion? Did you have a question? That is one of my theories. <laughs> This is what we've been working with in our practice, and I will say that, that, that we've been having some pretty great results. So we work starting with this cofactor perspective, and we kind of think about it like that. It's not that some microbial mediation would never be involved. It's not that we would never use an herb to kill some things or promote some things. That's totally in our toolkit, too. But I want to coach us to think from this ecosystem perspective and this nutrient-based perspective first. Whoops. So. Woo, finally, we're at the large intestine. Yeah, it can, although we should be careful. So the, um, so liver, gallbladder, gallbladder problems in particular are really um, at a height in this culture right now. Gallbladder surgery is one of the most common surgeries that's happening, which is a, a good heads up if we're looking at symptoms as a language, communicating with us about some stressors in our, in our system or some nutrient needs. We're struggling with bile production overall. Um, and when bile is not produced well, or if it stays in or it's not being ejected well, it can start to crystallize in the gallbladder and create a gallstone, right? It, things precipitate out and we get these crystals in the gallbladder. And if one gets stuck in the duct that um, comes out of the gallbladder, it can start to create an infection, a lot of pain. This is what gallbladder attacks are, the, the heads up that you've got some challenge with, bio, with gallstones. Um, and the, and the go-to in, um, in most of our medical system is if that's happening, we remove the gallbladder. But then you have a big a problem, which is you actually are still usually producing bile. So the liver is still producing bile. It's just not concentrating it in a way that's super effective. When I eat fat, I want to have a concentrated amount of bile that's released. I won't necessarily if I don't have, well, I won't if I don't have a gallbladder. So sometimes there's not a lot of bile being released. Sometimes there's actually too much bile being released not at the right times when we don't have a gallbladder. So we're getting like a slow trickle of bile into the gut. And we actually don't want bile always in that system. There are actually microbes that take bile acids apart. So sometimes we can end up with a microbial imbalance because we've got this kind of slow trickle of bile. So it isn't always great to just put bile into the system consistently. But with a fat-based meal, if we need that bolus of bile and we don't have a gallbladder, yeah, this is one of the places where because of a pretty big extenuating circumstance, we might want to say, could I replace that thing the body was making for this useful purpose? But if someone's just struggling with some gallbladder issues, my first go-to is not going to be to offer them an ox bile supplement. It's going to be to think about what are the cofactors that body would need to make bile itself. Could we jumpstart that process? So. We did get to the large intestine. We're hopefully all the way through the small intestine, and we've broken stuff down, the carbs, the proteins, the fats, and we absorbed that into the bloodstream. And we can use that for our physiology right now. And ideally, in a really healthy GI tract, what we're offering the colon, which should be this microbiome hub, is a diversity of fibers 
from plant foods, which is what lots of those microbes like to eat, it seems. This is also emergent science. And phytonutrients, like things like the phenols, are communicating with those microbes. They eat some of them. Some of them are used for intramicrobial communication. Um, and we have, ideally, this robust ecosystem that has lots of functional capacity. It can make things like short-chain fatty acids, like butyrate, that get cycled back into our bloodstream and back up to our brain. And this is where we're getting communication from our internal environment to our brain that, hey, I think the environment's pretty safe. You're doing pretty well if our microbes are making these things that are important cell signaling molecules. Also, they might be making some, they might be harvesting some vitamins and minerals uh, um, either from our food that didn't get harvested before or ideally even metabolizing, making those. In John Kemp's talk right before this, it was like fascinating, mind-blowing information about how this happens in root systems and plants and their relationship with microbes. Microbes are generating a lot of the micronutrients they need. We outsourced that too. So a healthful microbial ecosystem here is really important for that. So in order for that to be helpful in that way, we need the tone from the vagus all the way down at the um, lower GI. We're still getting that vagus communication. All of the function, all of those cofactors that we've talked about, upper GI to here, we need to be functioning in order to set us up well for the colon, magnesium for peristalsis, and then those fiber, phytochemistry, and also just making sure that the um, the bacteria or viruses, fungi themselves, are the ones that we would like to be growing there. And we can get all kinds of challenge here. Often this is not set up as well, and sometimes adding some of these to the system right away doesn't actually produce the results that we want. We don't necessarily, you know, what if I'm not digesting stuff super well up top, and what I'm offering to my colon is not just an abundance of fiber and phytonutrients, but it is maldigested carbohydrates, proteins, fats, some bacterial byproducts that came from my small intestine, and that's what I'm offering to my colon. The ecosystem might not look so robust as it does now. It's adaptive. It's doing a great job. It's digesting those proteins and fats that I didn't digest, but it's shaping the ecosystem that's here. So are all of these environmental inputs, right, that we're discovering, antibiotics, pesticides, all of different kinds of medications, body products, all of these things that are microbicides that are altering this ecosystem. So we're having some challenge here. So I think you guys will get these slides. I just made these charts because when we think about sourcing these nutrients, we want to think first about food, right? So we know from the work of the BFA that I can't tell you that, what, that a carrot is definitely a good source of beta carotene. I can tell you it could be. A carrot has the capacity to be that good source. Um, same goes here. So when I'm talking about nutrient sources, from food, these are, I'm, I've pulled out the cofactors that we talked most about in the digestive tract, so we're gonna highlight them again. B vitamins, so important as cofactors for all of digestion. These are some really, often can be some high sources of B vitamins, not the only source, but some of the most dense um, opportunities to digest B vitamins are in these foods. And you'll see animal foods come up a lot on this list. Meat or organ meats tends to be the most bioavailable form of a lot of these B vitamins. Not the only form, but definitely important. So there are some themes. Magnesium, zinc came up again and again. Vitamin A, vitamin C, iron, and these electrolyte minerals. And the food sources of these often, you know, again, we're thinking about seafood, we're thinking about animal foods, we're also thinking about greens, colorful plants, phyto, you know, phytonutrient rich plants, we'll talk about that in a second, and, um, and nuts and seeds, whole beans, whole grains, those kinds of things. So yeah, when we're talking about supporting digestion overall, if we're just saying, I want to bolster a relatively healthy GI tract and make sure <coughs> that it has the nutrient cofactors it needs for enzymatic function, I'm really thinking about whole foods from across the ecosystem and ideally sourcing them in a way that was produced you know, with the best shot we have at having them contain the nutrients that they um, ideally would contain. That, <laughs> yeah, these, <laughs> um, yep, that was the first one. So, there are some themes when we're thinking about a GI tract that is having more trouble. 
So we can think of that general idea of hitting those food groups, you know, maybe animal foods, greens, colorful plants, um, in a general way for digestive support. When we're thinking about a GI tract that is struggling, that might really need some cofactor support and is also a little bit stressed out. So some of those cycles aren't happening in the way that would be ideal. And we're getting some ecosystem stress in the GI tract, which means that we might be kind of losing a grip a little bit on the conversation that we're having with our food. If food is not being broken down in the way that's most appropriate, if our stomach, you know, if, if the small intestine lining is a little bit inflamed, if we're getting things across into the bloodstream that might ideally not be there, our conversation with the information coming in from our food is starting to be a little bit more challenging. And so when we're thinking about how to support a digestive tract that is challenged in this way, that is having these adaptive challenges, we can think along the lines of removing the stressors and increasing the resources. Removing the stressors, increasing the resources. And when we think about this as a whole nother talk of like what can stress the GI tract when we're kind of in this communication challenge. But generally, when we take these Venn diagrams of removing stressors, things that can stress the most and things that can nourish the most, we end up with some of these kind of GI healing reset diets that seem to center Animal foods, as diverse as an array of animal foods, well-raised animal foods, as someone can tolerate, maybe organs. Some of the lower phytonutrient greens in a lot of ways, maybe a little lower in sulfur, maybe a little lower in oxalic acid. Some of this stuff that can be more challenging if the conversation is challenged in the GI tract. And some starches that are nutrient dense, but lower in some of the more challenging compounds like lectins or phytates. Maybe some seafood and then oils that someone can tolerate. And I love this approach of looking at nutrition this way from a cofactor-based perspective, a physiology-based perspective, because it gets us out of the allegiance to a dietary dogma, right? This is not, I'm not like, I'm prescribing to the X diet, or I'm gripping so tightly to this idea about what nutrition should be or what I'm eating. I'm thinking about, for this person, based on the context at hand, what might be stressed in their ecology? What are the nutrient cofactors that might be really helpful for them? Where do I end up when I do that puzzle of removing stressors and increasing resources? This will not look the same for every person. This is just a general, this is like a common denominator that I see a lot, but the actual form that this takes look di looks different, depending on the stressors and the nutrients someone needs. So this is also just a very basic diagram of here are things that I often see stress a GI tract that's struggling with its conversation with our environment. Phenols, phytates, lectins, oxalates, amines, sulfurs, FODMAPs, which are fibers. So these might be stressful. They're stressful in this context. We actually need lots of these. This is where the conversation about nutrient density, I think, gets complex in our healing journey, is, well, phytonutrients, that's, what, that's phenols. That's what we talked about is good, right? That's what we want in our plants. It's true. That's what we want in to input into a system where the conversation is robust. Plants are like the primary conversationalists in our environment, right? They have lots of information coming in. Sometimes when my GI tract is stressed, I need to hibernate a little bit. I'm not so good at hearing all that information just yet. Then we have all those nutrients that were cofactors for the GI tract. And when we overlap, how can I get the most nutrients from my food? How can I get the least, you know, these stressors are gonna be bio-individual. Everyone's not gonna to react to all of these. These are just the questions I have. We often end up with that type of approach that I was talking about before. So that brings us to supplementation because Ideally, we're working on this whole systemic project, right? We've got, we really need ecosystem restoration at every level. We need to return that nutrient density to our food. We need to shift our relationship to food in order to stimulate our vagus function. We need to be able, we need that food to have the nutrients that are gonna jumpstart my GI tract. But I also need to be able to pull those nutrients off of my food. And if I'm stuck in some of these cycles, like, oh, my hydrochloric acid production is low, I'm not cleaving the nutrients really well, the you know, vitamins and minerals, those vitamins and minerals are really important to make hydrochloric acid, or I'm not digesting my fats well, but I need to digest fats to make bile. Supplementation can help there. 
I encourage us to think about it. I was listening actually to a podcast with Dan Kittredge, and this was like an, an aha moment. Someone was talking to him about, well, if you're thinking about ecosystem restoration in the farm system from this broad perspective, then why should a nutrient, should a, should a soil drench for your root system? You know, why should a, should a vitamin mineral drench or a microbial inoculant for the root system be necessary? Or why should a foliar spray be helpful? And he paused and he was kind of like, it shouldn't be. Like, if we're, if we're advanced in that project of ecosystem restoration, then we probably don't need an influx of molybdenum onto our leaf surface to, you know, just work with the nitrates that are there. Or we probably don't need the microbial inoculation because ideally that microbial cycling is happening in the soil we created. But often, given our modern context and where we're at in that ecosystem restoration process, a little root drench or a foliar spray can go a long way in jump-starting those ecosystem processes. So this is how I want you guys to think about supplementation when we think about nutrition. I'm working on the system overall, but can I add a little bit of a facilitator if I need to in order to jump-start, add, you know, work on some of these enzymatic processes we've been talking about? And when we think about supplementation, also a huge conversation. Just generally, think about it foundationally. So this is where I still say, even though I'm using some of these concentrated resources, I'm still in the role of a facilitator. I'm not in the role of a controller. I'm offering the body an educated guess about what it could use to speed up some of the reactions that I've interpreted it might be doing slowly. So foundational, cofactor-centered approach before we jump to replacing things the bodies make, should be making, before I say, oh, looks like your estrogen's low, perhaps you should have some estrogen, or looks like your glutathione's low, perhaps you should start taking glutathione, I wanna be thinking, what if I offered you the cofactors to make that thing, and I changed your environmental context a little bit so that the adaptation looked different and your resources looked different? What would you do with that? And it keeps the body in that decision-making role. The body is the driver here. Hopefully, our supplements are really high quality, right? So this is a largely unregulated industry and we want to be really careful, third-party tested, practitioner you know, oriented. Useful mineral chelates, a whole conversation, but minerals come bound to things in supplements and we don't want those things that they're bound to, either things that actively damage our system, which tends to happen sometimes with cheap vitamins, or we also want to be able to separate the mineral from the chelate easily, and maybe the chelate is even useful. If there's magnesium bound to glycine, well, I can take that apart quite easily, and I also can use the glycine that it was bound to. If it's bound to an oxide, mm, hard to pull off, and then I have something that's oxidative in my system, potentially. Useful mineral chelates, vitamins that are as close to the natural form as we can. This is where we get this gulf. There's always food, com I mean, information coming in in food that will just never be true in an isolate like this. So that's critical to remember. And we still want sort of as close to food-based as we can get when we're talking about vitamins low and slow when we're supplementing. So this also, when we're talking about I'm the facilitator and I'm letting the body run the show, I don't wanna bombard it even with a whole huge amount of a particular vitamin or mineral right away. I wanna say, hey, is this the amount that would be helpful for you? And then observe, what happens? What does the body do with that? And could it use more? Could it use less? We're gonna get a lot of important feedback from our physiology in this process if we're respectful of its pace. Careful with microbial mediation. So like we talked about, do I just wanna kill things or do I think about what are the ecosystem processes involved? Even in holistic healthcare, we do a lot of this, like jumping right to the microbial issue. I would really counsel us to start with this cofactor-based approach and see if the ecosystem can figure itself out with our improved inputs and our decreased stressors. And then, yeah, we have a strong relationship with antimicrobial plants as humans. We've used stuff like that forever, it totally has a role. We just wanna work on this support first, and a lot of the time it's way more effective. It's like, we'll be using herbal products for the, that microbial mediation in the small intestine after we've set up the body to use that stuff really well. All in all, we want to 
keep our focus on um, supporting the body to use food well and in supporting the person to build their relationship with food in a way that's positive overall, including food sourcing. And this is what this often looks like. This is not actually a good, this is like what I could find as a picture, but really this process is a spiral. When we're working on health, we revisit the same places again and again. We learn new things every time. It looks like this. Sometimes it looks like a big dive. It is not linear. And often this process can kind of look like this, a therapeutic reset along those lines that we talked about where that Venn diagram intersects, the addition of cofactor nutrients to support the system in using food better, differences in physical movement and nervous system support, the lowering of the toxins that are coming in, building a relationship with healing plants. I start to taste some bitter. I start to use some of these formulas as my body is ready all sets us up for actually an increase in food diversity, an increase in things like those prebiotic fibers, an increase in the phytochemistry we're so excited about here. So there's preparation that's required when a system is under stress, but ultimately when we're talking about getting to the next step of health, we have to restore that communication between something like a plant and my ecosystem. I need to be getting the information that helps me respond in a more resilient way not getting the information in a way that just sends me further and further into my stress. Same compounds, different context, all about setting up the context. So you can do this with any system. <laughs> this is a not scary, actually exciting pathway planner by Ben Lin. She studies this cofactor work um, all the time and has been one of the people that I've learned the most from. We really appreciate his organization, Seeking Health. And these, he is doing the research to put together these biochemical pathways in a way that centers the cofactor. So this is tiny, you can't see it, but he's looking at the transsulfuration cycle, which makes our main antioxidant, glutathione, the biopterin cycle, which is a precursor to a lot of our neurotransmitters, the methionine cycle, which is our methylation cycle, when everyone's so worried about MTHFR SNPs. So look at all of these pathways, and he's saying, okay, these are all the enzymes working in these pathways. Everywhere there's a little circle, it's an enzyme. And everywhere he's got a little arrow here with green, that's a cofactor nutrient he's identified. He's pulled out from the literature that's important to that enzymatic function. And everywhere that's in purple, that's a situation in the body that could inhibit the function of that enzyme. And these kinds of pathways are things that we study in our practice all the time and use to build our facilitator toolbox in terms of nutrients. So it's not just the digestive tract, that was our example today, but you can be using it under many different contexts in the body. And that is the story. <laughs> So we have 20 minutes for questions. Is this available online, the, the presentation? Um, I think it can be. I think this whole talk will be available. And then I guess, I don't know if the slides are posted, but I can certainly offer them to the BFA. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So the question is, do I have concerns about vegan and vegetarian diets? And do I recommend some Chinese fruits goji berries, I, don't, I mean, I obviously am not actually well versed in Chinese fruits because I can't repeat them to you. Um, but in terms of vegan and vegetarian diets, I do have some concerns nutritionally. Um, I think we're always, our relationship to food is super important, right? So when we're thinking about context, we're not just thinking about the physical food that's going into my body. My relationship, my worldview, my understanding around that food is really important. When we talk about that vagus function, my feeling of, of well-being around the choices I'm making has a big impact even on my digestive function. So if my worldview is not compatible with eating animal foods, then you know, that's important for me to put into my context. It's not that we absolutely can't you know, be healthy unless we're eating animal foods, but it's more of a challenge because as we saw here, and this is not a perspective, I was a vegetarian for 12 years, um, but as I, dive, as I dive into the nutrition work more, and I think especially about therapeutic nutrition, it is very challenging for me to rebuild, help someone rebuild their digestive tract without including animal foods. That's just, it's, a, it's a hurdle for us to get through um, because 
we can think about nutrient density in a few different ways, right? If we just do a biological assay of a kale leaf and a piece of beef, the kale might come out way on top in terms of like variety of nutrients that are in that kale with under the, you know, if we're just taking it apart chemically. But if we're looking at it in a functional way, if we're thinking for a human digestive tract, are the nutrients in that kale or the nutrients in the beef more bioavailable? Are they easier to extract? We're going to end up with the beef being the more bioavailable for our omnivorous style digestive tracts. So, and this is also how I think about it, is that when I talk about plants as those conversationalists, that's a beautiful thing. Like Guido was talking about in his talk, like John Kempf was talking about, it's like, a plant can be experiencing something in the ecology. It can be having a drought stress. And the phytochemistry that it's producing because of that drought stress, if I eat that plant in the same ecology, my biology gets a heads up. There's a drought. How are you going to adjust? It's that communicative. It's so exciting. And they can prompt healing responses in that way too, right? So a plant, the phytochemistry in plants that's very active, it often works by stressing our biology out a little bit, and then my biology responds by increasing its resilience. So actually, that flavonoid that came in, it was a little bit of a stressor, that phenol, but if I'm in a robust shape to adapt, my response is, oh, I'm more prepared to make antioxidants, whatever it is. If I'm in that place of, I'm really on this radical side of adapting for survival, and there's a bunch of stressors coming in and not as much resource, that phenol comes into my system, and instead of it being this call and response, this stress and resilience, it gets stress and stress. You know, like my body can't actually make the response to that call. And so I start to develop a, you know, food sensitivity to phenols, which I see in my practice all the time. Salicylates, so something, these phenol compounds that are very challenging in the context of some of these um, metabolic issues. So in that moment, Sometimes we can't just bombard the system with plant foods and expect it to get back on its feet. I do think this is there are a variety of opinions and it's an important conversation. I wish this was a compassionate conversation we were all having instead of an argument um, that um, sometimes the animal foods are not as communicative. The animals did their communicating in their life. And when they are not alive anymore, they are not as communicative with our physiology. They're more of an offering of nutrients. And so if my physiology is in a place where it's struggling with communication, I do find that animal foods are important to restoring the process. Yeah, so what are my thoughts on Lyme disease? Huge topic. And um, what are my thoughts on distilled water, or alkaline water? Lyme disease is just like a wild conversation probably for another time. Um, but is it... Are we struggling, you know, is, is the prevalence of Lyme both in our environment and how easily it's colonizing our human biology an ecological challenge? Yes, <laughs> I believe that's true. We're having an issue with our, you know, the mediators in our ecology that is absolutely allowing for that type of organism, a spirochete, to really do very, very well. Um, and, I, and absolutely, I think, when we're thinking about microbial colonization and our immune system, the, the interplay between those, like that's something we really need to think about when we're thinking about something like Lyme. It's like, is, how well is my body able to address that interaction? Really ends up being a game changer in terms of how sick I get or not sick. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, this perspective, we absolutely, I mean, I live in the Hudson Valley of New York. It's like the Lyme epicenter. <laughs> um, and I work on a farm where we raise pasture, right? So we're walking through grass all the time. And, um, and so Lyme is something that comes up a lot. And I, I work with other practitioners. Sometimes we have to bring out strong tools in that process, but absolutely is a cofactor-based approach where we start. Yes, and do I see even things like the doxycycline work better if we have done this cofactor work? Yes, absolutely. In terms of um, water, 
Um, yeah, also a hot topic. Probably there's people talking about water at this conference this weekend, I bet. But when I'm thinking about water, so distilled water is, I think, maybe Guido said yesterday, he's like, I think of the distilled water as thirsty water. <laughs> yeah, I think of distilled water as thirsty water too, right? Distilled water is mineral poor water. So when we put distilled water into that system where I'm trying to infuse more mineral density, it's going to take it from me. Um, so in situations of, you know, if, if that's our only option for mediating the microbes in our water, then absolutely we'll drink that water. But in terms of a health practice, unless you are really trying to do some short-term kind of detoxification thing where you're pulling out metals on purpose or something, I would, I don't recommend distilled water. In fact, the opposite, I'm curious about what happens when we put minerals into our water. Um, and can we make this more kind of nutrient dense water? In our practice, we offer our clients something called a water taste test. And it is this, it's a setup for yourself to explore what waters taste better to you using some mineral drops, some sea salt, some lemon juice, some other things. We, we set up kind of a water taste test station and then it's, then you explore what, how many mineral drops taste good to me? How much salt tastes good to me? And your taste receptors are a great great barometer for what kind of water is going to work well for you. And often people have kind of an aha moment of they've been like, I hated drinking water. Water just tastes blank. And then they put a few drops of minerals and the right pinch of sea salt for them. And suddenly it's like water is appealing. I want to drink that water. And that's a great sign that that water is helpful for you. Alkaline water, I, I um, yeah, I, I don't, I think there are instances when it might be helpful. It's not something I don't um, prioritize alkalinizing the water for my clients. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So she's saying in her practice is measuring heart rate variability, which is the um, difference between the the. Um, it's a it's a measure of nervous system function based on what our heart rate is doing between the inhale and the exhale, speeding up on the inhale, maybe slowing down on the exhale, how much more variability to an extent in that, like our heart actually should not be beating like a metronome. If it's beating more like a metronome, that's a good sign that what she's saying, we're in our sympathetic dominant state, we are more stressed. And if there's more variability, if that heart rate has more flexibility to an extent, it's a sign that our nervous system is in that more um, parasympathetic place that facilitates digestion. The vagus nerve is working well. It can be at the very end of the spectrum, the opposite. If the vagus nerve is on in kind of a freeze state, um, it, sometimes we can get very uh, high heart rate variability and it's, and it's not always amazing. But um, she's saying that, that what do you think about the importance of this kind of psycho-spiritual work, this, this work on our stress response system, and I think it's incredibly important. The more I do nutrition work, the more I think we can't do nutrition work alone. <laughs> um, it absolutely is one tool in our toolbox, and, the, um, and absolutely work with how our nervous system is reading its environment, whether it's able to even switch into that space of being more safe and more relaxed is a humongous component of digestive function. And I think often, yeah, like we said at the beginning, really overlooked. We can, and I did this in my own practice, bypass that part and move right to the nutrients. And more and more, we absolutely take a big stop at that area in our practice. And whether it is, um, yeah, someone working with trauma resolution from their history or someone um, who needs to put in a, a series of practices that are important to restoring that or make some big life changes or do some craniosacral work or all of those tools come in. And we measure heart rate variability too. And I usually track my clients. I'll have them, you know, I don't, I would love your thoughts on different apps and stuff to use, but um, that's something that we watch over the course of our progress with someone often. And it's very interesting to see where it starts and how it'll often also like at moments of the healing process, your heart rate variability will go down. You're more stressed out because all of this stuff is happening in your biology. And that's a good sign to say, hey, we need to slow it down. We need to focus more on that psycho-spiritual element. How can we get that heart rate variability into a better spot? so valuable overall, like when we're looking at what, um, when we think about how do we generally support a digestive tract to be healthful, 
absolutely fermented foods such an awesome component and in terms of helping us like pre-separate some of the nutrients, some of the vitamins and minerals from our food. Fermentation really helps with that. Um, it liberates, you know, and of course, is creating microbial populations that are hopefully beneficial to us as well. So a lot of communication from fermented foods and I think absolutely can be super supportive also on the like, it's a little bit acidic, like it's helping, it's on the flavor profile that's helping get digestive, um, the digestive system started. When we get into this place where that conversation is stressed and our GI tract is in a little bit more of a, you know, a radical adaptive state, I find that fermented foods can actually be challenging. And this is like a, what? That's not the GAPS diet. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, that's true. It's not true for everyone. <coughs> fermented foods often have a high histamine content because anything that is, um, digested by microbes will have a high histamine load. And so if someone is struggling immunologically in a way that means that they're producing excess histamine, if their microbiology is doing stuff that means they're producing excess histamine, if they're deficient in the cofactors that break down histamine, zinc, B6, they might not be breaking histamine down very well, and they might actually have kind of a low tolerance for histamine, and I've seen this happen where people are like, I'm doing everything I can to heal my gut. I've increased my fermented food intake. You know, I'm eating sauerkraut three meals a day, and I just feel horrible. And it's like, yeah, you're not wrong. We should listen to those alerts from our biology, but sometimes we get clouded by the information that's coming in that says fermented foods are good for the gut. Um, and so this is where all food is context dependent. There's no thing, you know, okay, maybe like a glyphosate blazed refined flour, you know, maybe there's like a food that sort of gets put in that like bad category, but by and large, I try not to almost ever do that with food. No bad, no good context. What's coming in? What's the information from that food? How is it interacting with our biology? Is that too much histamine for my system right now? Would I, would part of removing the stressors for my biology be reducing fermented foods for a time, increasing the nutrient cofactors, helping my body break down histamine, helping change the ecology in my gut so it wasn't producing so much histamine, and now, can we start to add sauerkraut a teaspoon at a time? Yes, is it beneficial? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is, she's saying, I'm hopeful that our taste receptors would help tell us what our body needed. And sometimes it seems like that system is not, not totally up and running and what are, what are my thoughts on that? And yes, overall, this is a process of um, re-communicating with our food so that we get better at, at trusting intuitive eating. Because ultimately we don't really want to be following food rules, right? That's not good for our relationship with food. That creates, talk about a vagus response, I start getting afraid of my food, which can totally happen with um, you know, therapeutic diets. Huge problem is I start putting food in that bad category in my own brain and suddenly I'm having a negative digestive response just because I've put it in the scary category. Um, so when we're talking about intuitive eating, yeah, this is, it's, it's kind of a re-education process. I think I've said this a million times, like these two talks that I've been to, John Kemp and Guido Mose, but they were both so great. But Guido was talking about the need to kind of re like bitters in um, herbs as a tool for like re-education of our palate because we have a pretty, uh, Taste-wise, we have a very like immature food system. So we haven't actually grown up all the time with like a lot of feedback in terms of taste and what that means for our biology. We haven't always had a lot of exposure. And so I think we actually have to relearn. I mean, the first time I ate fermented foods, I thought they were disgusting. Like I, I remember someone giving me a drink of kombucha when I was, I think 17, she had made it at home and I spit it out. I was like, that is, who drinks that? And now, like, I would spend, you know, $25 on kombucha every week or something like that. It tastes great to me. So there isn't, it's not so linear. Yeah, I wish, but it does work. Like, as our taste buds get increased exposure to these elements, I do think we can start to really trust. And if we're working in a whole food context, if we kind of shift what we're choosing from away from being hyper palatable processed foods, we get a lot better feedback into that system about what I would need. But absolutely, do I listen? And, do, and does, do I think that this helps actually 
take shame away from our food choices. Like I'll have clients who, this is an example I used the other day, she was having an immune flare. She's some kind of immune flare and she's like, I don't know what's happening to me. I am raiding my fridge for like carb snacks at night. You know, and she's, that's a full of shame feeling for her. And instead, thinking about the biology, it's like, well, when we get that kind of immune upregulation, our need for glucose goes up, actually. And if your body might just be talking to you, this is not, it's not you making a huge mistake and unable to control your, you know, you're a bad person because you're opening the fridge at night. It's like, of course you are. So now, how can we support your biology better so that that's not the adaptive choice, that's the first go-to. We can do something more nutritious. One more question, and then I think we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah, so detoxification is a big deal, and I will say, looking through this lens, I always want to support the foundational work of detoxification before we do a like, particular like detox mm -hmm. program of any kind, and I think that's also, that could be a whole other talk, but it's a really important thing that's often missed. Detoxification is a nutrient intensive process. When we looked at all the nutrients that went into bile production in the liver, that was a whole lot of nutrients. If I'm going on a juice fast as my detoxification protocol, I might, if I'm not set up, you know, if, if that's like the first thing I try, my body might not actually be able, it's going to have to set up a lot of systems in place to do detoxification well. And so the first step, whenever I think, you know, clients come in and they're like, I need to do a detox. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. We're going to start here at the top of the digestive system or supporting the nutrient cofactors you need or supporting your own detoxification cycles. And then if we want to start bringing in agents that stimulate and make sure your elimination pathways are open, like are you pooping, are you peeing, are you sweating before we try to instigate the mobilization of toxins. And then, yeah, I'm super curious. This is a place where I feel like I have to learn into which I've seen intensive detox programs absolutely backfire for clients where I get them after they've done any IV glutathione even, like really things that they're, this should be magic and they're like sicker than they've ever been because things got mobilized, they didn't get out and they are toxic. Um, so yeah, this first, elimination pathways open and then yeah, can we start to push catch? You know, that's Dr. Shade's idea, but I, we use similar ideas of like, could I stimulate bile production and then bind it and get stuff out? Could we be adding something like zinc on an empty stomach to try and start to pull some of those metals out of the body? Gentle stuff first, and then yes, do we need to ramp it up? Because absolutely, that idea of like, fungus are filling the ecological niche, protecting you from the heavy metal poisoning you might have, totally interesting and worthwhile consideration. So that's it. I <laughs>